As you can see from the schedule, we are now into the panel part of the proceedings. So our panel title is Ignorance Was Bliss, How Can We Regain Trust? And so I'll, I'll read the brief on this for you. So the requirements and sanctions introduced by GDPR, we heard about that earlier, have the laudable aim of increasing organisations' responsibilities for dealing with cyber security and holding them accountable for negligence that leads to breaches. Moreover, the requirement to notify and disclose details means that more incidents are now open to public scrutiny. However, while many organisations have used GDPR as a spur to improve their security, it's fair to say that many are still on the journey. As such, we'll likely see a growth of reported incidents with the obligation to disclose them having arrived before the security is mature enough to actually prevent them. With this in mind, it's worth considering the possible side effects of increased reporting. By shining a light on more breaches having occurred, do we risk actually harming confidence and the trust in the technologies and in the businesses that use it? This panel discussion is going to reflect upon how mandatory disclosure and the increased media focus that that's going to bring is potentially impacting upon user trust. How do we get the public to trust the technologies that may now be looking even more vulnerable? So that's the theme. And in order to help us address that, we have two parts of the equation. First, we have a panel on the stage here, and then we have you as the audience who will hopefully interact with the panel and pose them all the questions um, and enable them to share their expertise with you. So to introduce the panel, um, in the order I've got them on the sheet, not necessarily the order they're, well, they, it does match the order they're sat if we go from this direction. So firstly, we have John Finch. John's the Information Governance Manager for Plymouth City Council. He's responsible for data protection, security policy development and management, and managing the information asset register, um, and providing security advice for the council and its partners. Um, John's current CISSP, and he undertook uh, a master's degree here at Plymouth University back in 2001 with a thesis entitled Approaches to Establishing IT Security Culture. Do you remember that one, John? Yeah, it was good fun, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, so that's John. We also then have Maria Papavaki, an Associate Professor of Cyber Security from here at the University of Plymouth. Her research interests include insider threats, incident response, maritime cyber security, security assessment, social engineering, security usability, and security education. So a small list there. Um, her research outputs include 24 journal and 31 conference papers, and she's active in a variety of professional bodies um, and a fellow of the Higher Education Academy. Um, she's a member of the BCS, the ISP, ISACA, and a, a GIAC advisory board member, and she's also held GIAC Certified Intrusion Analyst and Penetration Tester Certifications and CEH. It's enough qualifications there, I would say. And finally, not last but not least, we have Chris Wills. Chris is a director of Caris Research Limited, an IT research consultancy based in Foy down in Cornwall. Prior to this, he was the director of an information systems research centre at Kingston University in London. Chris has managed and undertaken research and consultancy projects for a range of organisations, including the MOD, the UK Police Service, the Health Service, the Department for Transport, and the Mass Transit Railway Corporation of Hong Kong. Just to throw another one in there. Chris has over 30 years' experience in the formulation of user requirements and in the design of socio-technical systems. So there we are. That's our panel. They are the ones with the expertise. I'm merely the conduit towards uh, getting questions to them and responses out to them and to, to set things going and just to allow you to think about the questions you'd like to pose i'll ask the first question and we'll see where we go so panel are we now at risk of undermining the confidence in online technologies and services which, which was often challenging to build up in the first place to be honest so where do we think we are now in terms of public and business trust and confidence i think public confidence is is at an all-time low uh, Edelman Intelligence, uh, who produce a trust barometer every year, which is a study of the level of trust in various indices across 28 developed countries, have concluded that uh, this year uh, the fear of fake news is greater than it has ever been. Um, and so I think we have a real uphill climb ahead of us. Uh, they describe last year as being the battle for truth with the issues emergent uh, post Snowden and WikiLeaks and the Cambridge Analytica situation and the possible manipulation of votes both uh, in this country and uh, abroad in the States. 
And so I think we have a real problem. On the other hand, I wonder uh, whether the public really care. Um, because I think there's a certain amount of apathy out there. And I think, as one commentator has already noted, I think once you have them by the apps, their clicks and minds will follow. And so I think this is probably uh, more of an issue for business uh, than it is for the public. Uh, we heard today about the GDPR and the new Data Protection Act. Um, I made the point earlier that last year very few prosecutions were actually brought in the UK uh, by the Information Commissioner's Office. Most of those prosecutions are aimed at large businesses. And so those of you who, who are in the audience who, like me, are from an SME probably need to worry a little less than you might have worried about uh, these new pieces of legislation because they're actually not going to come for you. Um, they are only going to come for the big boys. Is that going to affect the confidence that your customers have in you uh, and the products that you produce? I think probably the answer to that must be yes. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, from my point of view, I think there's definitely overconfidence in some of the IT systems we've got. Um, mem members of the public are quite happy to put their data in any system and they're actually trusting that it's actually been developed securely. I think this will be a wake-up call on how insecure a lot of websites are. Um, probably many people here have been involved with penetration testing of websites um, at some stage. I've only ever known one to pass first time. And that was, uh, when you actually looked at it, it looked a really bad website. But every single um, other one it's just you wouldn't go anywhere near it with your data until they've actually fixed the issues when, um, that have been highlighted. And we see within the work environment, people are quite happy to use whatever website they can uh, for things such as data transfer. And it's a big thing that we're looking at at work. People need to transfer data between organisations and members of staff are just picking Websites you wouldn't even go, go near um, if you actually did the proper due diligence. So I think there is a misplaced um, over-trust in a website at the moment. And I think um, with a lot more breach reporting and a lot more awareness of what can go wrong, I think um, confidence will be uh, realigned more than uh, um, undermined. And actual people realise what type of websites they're putting in the data. And they should be asking the questions, are these secure? Thank you. Maria? Sorry, just give me... Yeah, all right. Um, so I think that, if anything, legislation such as GDPR uh, has introduced accountability. Um, as a result, what I am expecting is that um, possibly customers uh, will not care so much about security, but eventually it will become a factor when it comes to choosing where who they want to do business with <coughs> so it will become a parameter um, and so when it comes to actually building this confidence at least it will be informed decisions and they will be informed on the information that is in the media or the the stories that are being released and so i would say it is a good thing it's um, in the sense that it highlights the importance of cybersecurity, and if anything it, it's a wake-up wake call for businesses to realize that they cannot operate easily and competitively um, in a modern environment without taking care of their cybersecurity. Does this prompt any immediate questions or comments in the room? Ah, we have a couple from this side, one from a potentially predictable source, um, and we have one over here. So this side of the room is now beginning to participate as well, and we have one up right. So Sarah, you're going to be busy running around. So Bob, I think, was first, and then Nick, then back there, and then over here. Thank we'll you, keep Sarah. It busy. Well, I'll, I'll ask Chris, because he's the new member of the panel I haven't met before. So I'll direct all my questions at him. Uh, Chris, I think there are two-fold problems here. One is the, the stick that organisations are hit with, whether they be small or medium, is not big enough. The quickest way to sanction their behaviour and get them to change is to remove certification completely, not give them a warning and a pat on the back and say, there, 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 you've got six months to fix it. I think if companies were actually 
embargoed from trading online, I don't mean face to face, they would change their behavior. The second thing is trust can only be built up in certain companies and retailers particularly if you know how good or bad they are. So I think penetration test results should be published by company. And what I would like to invite you and the panel members to give, me, uh, give us your views on those two points. Okay, well, it seems to me that uh, following your train of thought, we're about to enter a Stalinist brave new technological world, <laughs> uh, where if you don't conform, it's off to the economic stalag. I mean, it, it's, it's not practical, however desirable it might be, it's simply not practical because you're, you place huge overheads, particularly on small and middle-sized businesses, uh, that these would not, simply not be sustainable. It's the scale, uh, scale of a company's... I, 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 think, I think for big companies, for big players in the marketplace, I, I think that's a very good idea. Um, and I'm surprised that the legislation hasn't been hedged in terms of you know, administrative capacity of, of organisations or the number of employees they have to place more uh, onerous reporting uh, and security burdens on large companies than are placed on small companies. At the moment, uh, the legislation, as I read it, applies equally to all organisations. And uh, for me, that's completely wrong. I mean, you know, I, I run uh, a, a very small business. Um, to, you know, we, do we pro process personal data? Yeah, I, I guess we do. I mean, we're currently building um, And so inevitably, uh, there's some, some personal data leaking out and we're having to anonymize it and deal with those issues. Is it worth putting me out of business if I make a mistake? Probably not, no. And so I, I think we'd have to be very careful about how we went forward on that basis. And the second point? Uh, Sorry, remind me. Uh, the issue about... Uh, so. The issue about uh, compliance. How do you, uh, why aren't we issuing penetration test results for organizations? Uh, but because most organizations are too small to be able to undertake. No, I'm talking about the large. Are you talking about large, large organizations? <coughs> well, because that isn't the way that the legislation has been framed, and maybe it should have been framed that way. You know, maybe some uh, consultation should have taken place in the industry at large uh, by the legislators before they started writing the law. Uh, of course, they haven't this time. When have they ever? So, if I can answer you, both your questions. Um, the first one around the stick, I think there already is a stick. Just a lot of companies are not becoming um, aware of it yet. See, one of the big things in the um, New Data Protection Act was a, a, the extension of the provision for compensation as a result of the breach uh, to include distress rather than just uh, material financial. Um, and as a public-facing local authority, we're experiencing a, a huge increase in members of the public reporting breaches, most of which aren't actually breaches. But um, in their report, nearly 90% of them are saying, and also we want compensation. And that's going to be the big stick that affects a lot of companies. It's not the um, certification being taken away. It's the fact that they will have to pay out compensation for even the most minor breach. Um, if there's a alleged distress um, caused. And to the second one, should organisations publish pen test results? Um, I think you might be setting a d dangerous precedent because by publishing the results of a pen test, especially of an one that where the where vulnerability is identified, you can enable an attacker to identify the weak parts of a company. What companies should be doing is actually um, being a bit more open with the customers they've got and um, you know remediation plans and, and how they actually protect data that we share with them but by publicizing all of this you can actually see where the low-hanging fruit is and it gives the attackers um, quite a distinct advantage they shouldn't be no but that, that will tell another story if they that, you know um, they haven't fixed these issues <coughs> Um, then suddenly become a much bigger target. Maybe there's a halfway house. After three months or six months, they're subjected to another test. And if they're vulnerable, it's 
public domain material. Hmm. I think that debate could go on and on. Uh, okay, so um, just to answer your question about compliance, um, there, have, there has been other regis legislation in the past and uh, it was interesting to actually study how businesses or the, uh, the industry um, responded to it. So uh, looking at how uh, the banking industry um, has um, been affected essentially by similar legislation, we could see that Initially, in the first stages, um, they did adopt a lot of technologies. They, they weren't necessarily uh, sure how to use them, and they were doing it mainly for compliance, just to make sure that nobody would be able to, uh, you know, it wouldn't, they wouldn't be able to hurt their business, uh, you know, with a stick, basically. Um, but eventually, the technology and the use of that technology matured, and so they actually started seeing the benefit of, of this as well. So. Um, if uh, history essentially repeats itself, if we learn something from this, um, sometimes we do need legislation to uh, to say, right, this is what you have to do as a minimum. Um, and so organizations might have to adopt different practices um, in the hope that eventually they will actually start seeing the benefits of it as well. Um, whether uh, they should be publishing penetration testing results, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, you don't want to be doing the work for uh, the other side and essentially just giving them out the information that they might have to uh, spend resources to find out themselves. Um, but uh, not everything, um, essentially not the same solution fits everybody. So you have critical infrastructure, you have small businesses, you have large organizations as well. So um, having that discussion as to what information, publicly available information, uh, how this can be scrutinized, you know, that could be a useful uh, discussion, definitely. Okay, we had another question just behind you there. So, and just a reminder to the audience, when you're asking questions, when you then, if you then continue to speak, can you make sure you've still got the mic in front of you so that others in the room can hear and also so it ends up on the recording? Thank you. Okay, this is a bit more of a, a comment and uh, open to discussion. It's using an analogy. In, back in the 90s, we faced the problem of uh, we'd built a rope bridge between two chasms and we were encouraging people that it's safe, you can come across and actually use the internet for buying and selling and things like that. Um, I think the problem was that that rope bridge has then ended up with millions of people crossing over it and it's never been gone back to to be properly re-engineered and, and uh, the role that I think we need to head towards is the equivalent of the certified structural engineers when we're developing these apps to give us the confidence in having the proper infrastructure and the uh, development behind them along with periodic checks and uh, safety inspections and things to be making sure they're suitable for that sort of traffic and getting that transparent is where we need to be heading to get this trust back. I, I totally agree. You can probably compare the um, internet almost to the car industry in the, the sort of 50s, 60s and 70s. Um, it was quite immature then. Safety was not a concern. I mean, companies like Ford even made a business decision to keep selling a very dangerous car that actually killed people if you um, bumped into it. Um, because it would cost more to replace that part than um, they'd have to pay it in damages. That style of thinking has gone out of the car industry completely now. Um, and, and people expect cars to be safe and even things like um, the Volkswagen emissions test showed that people can lose confidence even if um, cars are not being honest. The internet industry has got a long way to go to get, get to there, but like you're saying, it needs to be built in, engineered, and we're on the journey to get there, but it's going to take um, quite a long time, hopefully not as long as uh, the car industry. Anybody else? Um, yeah, the, the, the term the, the internet industry uh, really interests me because when you actually think about that, the, the internet is absolutely ubiquitous. It's embedded in every business transaction, almost every social transaction that, that, that now takes place. Um, I mean, I, I, I really you know, liked your, your analogy of the rope bridge. And in a sense, that's an argument about um, certified standards. So that implies uh, 
the creation of some kind of uh, certifying authority. Um, and by definition, that would have to be in the public sector. And at the time when the public sector is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed as a consequence of austerity, where is the money going to come from to do that? And so uh, if I'm to throw a bomb into the room, and I think I'm going to, um, if, if I ruled the world and I was deciding how we should spend our tax pounds, would I be spending it on paying people to certify the security of large organisations, or would I be building more and better hospitals and schools and staffing them properly? And so I think we have to inject a bit of, you know, reality into, in, into these discussions. Yes, of course, it would be lovely if we had really good security. It would be fantastic if we had the money to pay for a certifying authority uh, in an ideal world. But of course, we don't live in an ideal world. We're just having to rub along the best we can with the diminishing resources that we find at, currently at, at our disposal. And so I think you know, all of these things have to be uh, worked into that mix. Could I just respond to that? Isn't the same argument could be made about health and safety and food hygiene and things, but we don't accept that that's an argument to not do it. Well, we do, actually, because if you read the health and safety legislation, it's couched in the term reasonably practicable. And so if something isn't reasonably practicable as an employer, you don't have to do it. That term, which for me is an entirely reasonable thing to say, isn't included in the provisions concerning... Um, privacy or, or security in either the GDPR or the Data Protection Act in its older uh, setting or indeed in its latest version. Um, okay, so I think it's your analogy is actually really useful um, and we have not had that um, uh, mentality uh, in security and uh, web applications and the e-commerce services. So software vendors have had to essentially be held accountable and they have they have had to adopt a more formal response to vulnerabilities and secure software development this has not necessarily been the case uh, for other services and applications and um, there are standards of course uh, that people need to follow but um, are they held accountable do you actually monitor the vulnerabilities no Okay, and um, but if we actually want to think about the economy and the scale of actually securing all of this, um, a lot of questions have to be raised, right? Um, so, um, yeah, I don't have the answer to the question, but perhaps another question that we need to ask ourselves is um, about the security design. And a lot of the times, by making um, design decisions right from the start, we can save ourselves a lot of money and we can make our lives a lot easier. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. There was a further question somewhere over there. Oh, there we go. Don't worry, this side of the room, we're coming your way in a moment. I've just remember, I was just uh, thinking about this a few, a few minutes ago. There have been, I'm not sure if people will anyone in this room, well, some people in this room m might remember, um, Microsoft's Xbox Live service and Sony's PlayStation Network service have both been hacked in the past. Well, like they've had user credentials leaked or personal information, but, but they're still around now. And it, it sort of depends on how large the company is as to how as to whether or not they, it's it's like if there's not a competitor, like it, like the more or less the same thing. And um, large companies, they can continue a lot of the time operating after they've been hacked, but. Um, So is the question linked to their, basically their monopoly position enables them to carry on regardless? Yes, yes, that was, that, I was trying to think of the word then, that's what I was thinking of. The monopoly allow, with some companies, they do have the unfair advantage of the monopoly which allows them to continue. Hmm. Okay, panel, thoughts? 
Um, I think PlayStation Network and Xbox were um, pretty unique cases in the service they provide. Yet, yeah, like mm. you said, it is a monopoly, but um, the desire for that service was far greater than the people's concern over the data, and that's one of the key things to consider. Um, the actual data that was taken, um, very low value really, um, mostly email addresses and names when it comes to PlayStation Network, and Sony spent a lot of money um, compensating people. Okay. And um, some email, some credit cards. I'm not too sure. Although I think some credit card details were were leaked. Yeah, but um, anyone that lost um, financial money in that generally was uh, um, got it back from the credit card company. The minor inconvenience they would have had to do is cancel the card and order another one. But the value okay. they placed on that PlayStation Network service was far higher than the value they placed on the data. And I think that's one of the things that people need to consider. Uh, BA, um, that's going to be a, a litmus test on how people view um, that company moving forward. I think that'd be a, a key um, player well, in this market. Well, nowadays, I mean, they did exist before, but now, look, now like you've got Steam, which did exist, but it wasn't as big as it is now, on the Nintendo Switch. But, but back then, it, it's again the monopoly, and I, I, see, I see what you mean now. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 not just a monopoly, it's the value people pla place on actually using yes. that service over the value they place on that data. Okay. We had a hand shoot up there um, mm. with, I think, a response to the, the answer. So if we could pass <laughs> the mic in that direction. So observationally, I think you're already seeing moves that are occurring that will put us in a better position. If you look at some of the stuff that NCSE has done over the last 20 years or so, it has very much been about creating markets. If you look at what they're doing in combination with their partners within the European Union around, for example, um, bug bounty programs and the more formalization of disclosure processes, that is starting to happen. It's, it, it, is, it is going to be difficult because if you look at it practically, the only organization as far as I'm concerned in the world that's managed to really successfully pivot has been Microsoft. That's how difficult a problem is. There's one company in the world that's managed to do it. But it is starting to happen, and I think you need to look at making sure that pan-governmental um, cooperation exists so that we're not just tackling it as the UK, we're tackling it as Europe, we're tackling it through the UN, through the European Union, dare I say it, etc. But I think it's already starting to happen. It's probably just not at the point yet where it's in the eyes of the masses. Go and look at something like NCSE's health check for all of the gov.uk domains. Go and look at what the Dutch government have done, similar, very, similar, very similar work over there. That kind of thing is only going to get formalised internationally, in my opinion. I agree. What, what the NCSC is doing in those, those sort of um, spheres is actually really, really good. We use MailCheck, we use WebCheck that they're providing. I don't think there's a great, greater public awareness of the ch actual background checking that the National Cyber Security Centre is doing, and they're going to be offering additional services moving forward, um, but the benefits to the UK economy are um, probably undervalued at the moment, but it, it does provide, especially in the .gov.uk space, um, essential um, intelligence into where our risks are and what we need to do. Yeah, I think the, make, the, the, the point you make about, about reporting is, is an important one. I think that should really be the keystone of all future legislation. I think if everybody is made to report and report promptly, uh, the sooner reporting comes out, the better we are able to you know, deal with an emergent threat. A threat rolling on for a number of weeks before anybody realises it's happening is, is a very, very bad thing. And I'd much rather see a greater emphasis placed on the need to report and sanctions applied to those who don't report when it can be shown that they were aware that a breach had happened or that a security event had taken place. Uh, and, you know, the, 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 the fines of up to 4% of, of turnover that are being bandied about in, in the... Uh, the the, the new legislation, because I, I just don't think that's, that's helpful. And to anybody but a large organization, it's completely meaningless anyway. You know, what organizations need is, is help to do this stuff. So, you know, we need the kind of work that's going on uh, 
nationally in, in, in the certs and the C certs to support businesses and to support the public at large. That's the way forward. Okay, thank you. There was a hand over here some time ago. There we go. Yeah, um, in your introductory question, you asked about whether the public were losing confidence in the technologies. Um, I think as technologists, and I invite the panel to comment, as technologists we're losing confidence in some of the technologies, whereas as the public are actually losing confidence in the businesses that are using those technologies. And a lot of this is actually down to the way that it's reported in the mainstream, that it is the business that is blamed for these breaches, rather than potentially zero-day exploits, which mm -hmm. they have no effective means of defending against. Um, I think I take the view that, that uh, technology isn't neutral. Uh, technology is shaped by the people who pay for the design and the building of that technology. And so technology uh, implicitly involves a set of values, the values of the people who paid for the creation of that technology. Um, and so we're not talking about a technological problem, strictly speaking. We're talking about a socio-technological problem. Um, and that's something that probably we haven't done too much thinking about. And we, we need to take a bit more seriously than we, than we have hitherto. You know, the idea that a piece of software is, or a system is completely neutral is, is, is clearly wrong. Um, you know, systems are designed to do particular things and to behave in particular ways and to react in different ways to different data inputs. And all of those are values that are implicit in the software uh, and implicit in the people who paid for the development of that software or that system. So I think it's very complicated. Well, I think the basis of your question, wasn't it, is, or perhaps, is confidence being lost in the wrong people? So confidence is being lost in the businesses who are the, the users of the technology and somebody else is actually responsible for that technology being flawed. Was that the basis? Um, well, the, the basis was that no matter where the flaw lies, uh, the mainstream media and therefore m and the majority of the public tends to blame the business mm -hmm. yeah. rather than the technology, whereas as technologists we tend more to blame the technology rather than the business. So you've, you've got an essential dichotomy between right. the two views there. Um, the, the two views need to meet in the middle in that, yes, the businesses are potentially knowingly using flawed technology, but also the businesses may be using technology that they don't know to be flawed. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I still think it's, it's, it's a socio-technical problem. We've just built the biggest, most expensive warship this country has ever launched, uh, HMS Queen Elizabeth. Uh, its systems are running Windows XP. Who made that decision? Who rethought that decision? Who leaked that out to the press before the ship was launched? You see, it's much, much more than simply about technology. It's about the, 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 the ethos and the thought that goes behind the building of that technology and the way it's shaped. It's not just a technological problem. It's a political problem. It's a social problem. And of course, all of these things boil down to trust. So if as a small business I'm using you know, a, a, a piece of software, who it's made by is immaterial and that software is flawed and I know it's flawed and I continue to use it and that affects my customers. Is that a reflection on me and my business or is it a reflection on the people who, who, who built, designed, implemented that piece of software? Well, it's, uh, that bit of it has got to be down to me, isn't it? So, I, you know, these things are not black and white. They're not straightforward. And it, I agree, it, the businesses are responsible for um, implementing most of these technologies, but there are some technologies that are, are fairly widespread, um, mainly because of the ease of use. And I'll, I'll, I'll pick on WordPress. WordPress is probably one of the most um, commonplace content management systems for websites now. Um, I wouldn't go anywhere near using a WordPress site because it's also got... Um, one of the biggest list of vulnerabilities ever associated with it but people use it because it's easy and and, and sometimes businesses um get forced into um decisions that they don't necessarily agree with but um under mass 
you know, mass usage um, pressure. And a, a good example, I'm not going to name the system, we recently implemented a major corporate system that was purchased purely on the, the principle that um, it's the most popular system of that type within the country. And my argument was, well, the Sun's the most um, read newspaper in the country, but I wouldn't go there for any source of news that's reliable. So, um, you know, sometimes businesses are, um, their hands are tied, but they do have to take as much of a lead as they can in trying to um, move away from these insecure technologies and um, they have to accept some of the blame, sadly. Um, okay, so um, looking back at uh, reported incidents and how essentially who takes the blame for the different security <coughs> problems, um, essentially we, we tend to see a story repeating. Um, so the published um, information will uh, invariably say, oh, um, our, uh, network security and um, our defenses were very strong, but it was one user who clicked on the wrong link and that's how um, the system or, you know, the, uh, the system got hacked and that's how the security problem started. Um, so, and this is a very common theme. I'm not trying to dispute that story, but we, or I have, um, noticed uh, a common theme there. So the security professionals are saying, oh, it's the user's fault. They're not doing what they're supposed to. Um, but of course, we are not looking at um, any of the misconfigured systems, any of the insecure software that is being regularly used. Um, it is mainly the, the users that, as far as, you know, security professionals are concerned, is the problem. Um, then, uh, we did evolve essentially uh, to realize, okay, now we have to uh, evolve our security to make our uh, security more usable and involve users in that decision to allow them to use the security services and uh, controls and uh, not undermine them, uh, educate the users and more of that is happening. Uh, but at the same time, we're not really looking at the problems or, you know, we, we say about unpatched software and the fact that uh, software is not being uh, unpatched, but we're not looking at the usability of doing that and the potential problems that um, could fall on um, an organization or technicians, uh, any incompatibilities that uh, all of this might uh, fall. So ha having this balance between usability, you know, why would you use uh, Microsoft XP? Yes, I don't really know why, but even if you look at the popularity of old um, operating systems, because they were so usable, they, they, are, they were still being used, and some applications are still running on this old legacy software. And you can't exactly just wipe it out, but you still have to recognize the risks, and you still have to um, essentially build your security around it um, to make your business um, uh, still operate. Um, and so it's a very complex problem and um, sometimes, uh, you know, one group essentially likes to blame the other and, you know, the business will say, well, why do I need security? Because um, it's just costing me money and they don't necessarily understand why um, they have to invest in this. So the, I, you know, you are right in the sense that sometimes technology is not being understood and also um, we don't know who, whose responsibility it is, but essentially it's everyone's responsibility. Um, and sometimes even legacy software you cannot ignore and it will still be there. You cannot replace it necessarily. And, and just to quantify the Windows XP <laughs> query, um, guided missile systems and things like that on ships, they have to be 100% reliable. Um, Windows XP is tested. Um, they know they can rely on it to fire that missile at a specific time. Um, they just don't connect it to the internet. Uh, actually, that was the point I was going to make about XP. Windows for warships is fine because it's not internet connected. And interestingly, the NHS running <laughs> XP probably saved it quite a lot in the WannaCry attack because XP just crashed rather than propagating it. <laughs> 
Any other questions in the room? We have one over there and one right there and one behind you. So we have several. Hi there. Um, speaking to friends and family uh, and mentioning the word GDPR, surprisingly an awful lot of them know what GDPR is. It's that really annoying thing that makes you have to click OK and accept on every website you visit nowadays. Um, and that's about the, as much as they understand it other than it's got something to do with biscuits. Um, if you were uh, the architect of GDPR, what would you have done differently so that it doesn't just annoy people in having to click OK and accept um, blindly on every website they visit nowadays? Uh, I think, uh, I think I, I've, I've already said, uh, I, I think that, uh, you know, that the GDPR is, is, is an overkill. I think the, the broad public at large actually don't care a great deal about their privacy and their security. I think that's certainly true in this country. I mean, there's been a raft of academic studies showing that, uh, that that's particularly true in this, in this country. It's true to a slightly lesser extent in Spain. Privacy is a huge issue, though, in, in, in Germany. Uh, less of an issue, strangely, in Austria. I mean, there have been lots and lots of studies looking at whether people care about street cameras. In this country, nobody cares about street cameras. There are street cameras everywhere. We're told quite wrongly that they keep us safe. Of course, they don't. Some of us understand that. But we still don't mind whether we're filmed going into a car park or going down a motorway or where we park our cars. And so I think you know, the bottom line is that, that people really don't care. I think that people are interested in, in the apps. And if they want to use the apps, they don't care what the consequences of using that app or this app is. As I said at the outset, you know, once you have them by the app, their clicks and minds will follow. And I think that's broadly true. Um, I think it's much more of a, uh, an issue for business. I think it's a much, much bigger issue in, in government and regional and local government where there's an issue of due diligence. And there's no hiding place. Uh, I think even with the reporting requirements that are placed on private companies in the new legislation, I think many companies will do everything they can not to report data breaches. And how will we know? Who's going to go around and police that? Nobody. What are the pr probability of them being caught by not reporting things? Zero. They're not going to be caught. They know that. We know that. And so, you know, the GDPR is going to place potentially a massive overhead on local and regional government who are already stretched <laughs> and place very little burden on large companies who are far, far better placed to, uh, you know, uh, pay for the, 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 the technology and the improvements that are required as a function of that legislation. And so I think, you know, legislation like this is, is just not the way forward. Um, I don't think it's practical. I think it gives the appearance of creating a sense of security in the mind of the public that's absolutely illusory. It's, it's not real. Okay, Chris, thank you very much. Um, given that we had quite a number of hands go up, let's move on to the next question. Where were the other hands? So we've got one right behind you, Sarah, and then one over there. Hi, thanks. Uh, I actually was, I used to have a Windows XP machine. I think I cried whenever they took it away, but anyway, that's <laughs> it. Slight aside. Uh, my question was, is, are we heading towards cyber meltdown? Uh, and my, uh, I mean, the basis behind this is, is we're using such uh, similar technologies now to access data on the internet, OAuth, uh, JWT tokens, uh, and basically, I mean, you know, look, I mean, are, are we going to, I mean, again, we push so much of this information onto the cloud now. Are we in a case where was it there's a chance that actually was it, I mean, you know, there may be a compromise here somewhere uh, and will suddenly cities stop working? Okay, cyber meltdown, discuss, panel. Um, potentially, yes, if we don't do things properly. Um, and you say cities meltdown, uh, you're referring, referring to the diehard um, force scenario where they used a cyber attack to actually completely take down a city. So um, it depends how we implement it. And that almost answers the previous question as well, is it's all about how we do it rather than... Um, what the legislation says. Um, all the cloud is, is, is just your data in a different place. Yeah, we've always had data in data centers. Um, all that's happening at the moment is, is it's going into data centers in different locations rather than localized ones. Um, 
I've been involved in projects in the last 20 years where we've moved from servers in individual departments to centralizing that on a storage area network. All cloud is an extension of that, but we need to do it properly and need to think about what we're doing and, and the proper mitigation to put it in place to avoid a cyber meltdown or um, when the first city goes down, learn the lessons from that really. Die Hard 4 is a training video for Plymouth City Council, clearly. <laughs> Maria, briefly on that one. Yeah, so we have seen evidence of uh, cyber weapons uh, attacking infrastructure, uh, even if it's for investigation only, uh, to show whether a feasibility, uh, to see whether this could be done. So we know that something like this could be done, uh, and essentially that is why we need to take steps uh, to make sure that at least it's not easy. Um. Okay, thank you. Chris, but it, briefly. But it is easy, isn't it? It really is easy. I mean, if you wanted to destabilize the banking structure in this country, you could wander down uh, a couple of streets in Docklands, lift up a few uh, BT manhole covers, lob a couple of grenades in and walk away, and it would take out the entire internet backbone that runs from Western Europe through the UK out into the States. So it is easy. And are we guarding those manhole covers? We're certainly not. So are we worrying about the wrong target? Maybe we are. This should not be taken as an endorsement or an encouragement. <laughs> there was a hand up over here. <laughs> so we get a disclaimer in. <laughs> Steve told me to say that. <laughs> I'll edit you out. <laughs> we all have to pass a driving test to drive on our roads. Perhaps a better analogy would be that um, a pilot flying the plane that we're going about on has to pass a test to fly the plane. Um, should we make cyber essentials compulsory? Is that, would that be a better way of legislating our uh, personal security for all companies that are looking after data and also addressing the, the apathy that apparently is around for people not really caring about their data? It's important whether they care about it or not. Okay. Could um, we? Should we? Well, to the first point, you don't actually have to pass a driving test to drive a car on the road. Um, there's just a penalty if you don't. Uh, you, you get disqualified from driving. There's nothing physically to stop someone just getting in the car and driving. They don't, you know, the cars don't have to be um, started using your license or anything. It's just a piece of paper um, that shows you're competent to drive a car. Um, Likewise with Cyber Essentials, and I think the key point that Chris made earlier is if we made everyone do Cyber Essentials, it might actually be meaningless because 50% of the people that actually get assessed for the accreditation fail it. So there's probably more value from going for Cyber Essentials Plus where people are being um, externally checked. But um, when you're getting people to assess themselves, and it's almost down to the ISO 27001 scoping argument. Um, unless you're getting it checked externally and verified, um, it's almost meaningless. And likewise, with a driving license, unless someone is physically checking every time you go in that car, um, passing the test is almost, um, it, it doesn't matter until you do something wrong. Anybody else quickly on that one? If not, um, there was a further hand at the back, and then we got a hand at the front as well. Okay, so right to the back there, Sarah. Get you moving along. Hi there. Um, with respect to um, confidence on websites, uh, Barclays have done a lot of really good work recently, a lot of adverts bringing cybersecurity to the fore, vishing, all sorts of things. One of the ones that was slightly worrying was they ran an advert on uh, SSL and if you see the padlock it's nice and secure which to me gives a false impression that if you've got a certificate you can trust the site. Issue with that is you can put a certificate anywhere obviously that doesn't mean that you've changed your default passwords you've checked for cross-site scripting um, given that I think last start I heard was over 9% of sites now have certificates it worries me if the public are impl implicitly trusting that padlock, um, it might not always be as secure as they think. I mean, there was a, a screenshot on the screen earlier for Twitter, I think it was, showing the security settings, how to check by clicking. It was running TLS 1.0, which I wouldn't trust that site with that 
I certainly won't be going there again now. Um, so the issue is how do we create a system where we can trust websites if that padlock isn't enough? Um, I know that I have two websites, one hosted by SiteGround, who every month run a scan for me for free. They tell me that I'm nice and secure. Uh, GoDaddy, on the other hand, it was an extra £10 a month to get that same assurance. So should the assurance for making sure that the general websites out there are at least not full of buggy scripts beyond the ISP or the website provider? Is there a certification process we can, we can have? We've got PCI DSS for payments, but not every website that takes your personal details and your logins necessarily then have a paywall. So is there a way that we can institute for the public, this website can be trusted, they've gone through this process, rather than just you can trust this little padlock that, that only really you can trust the communication, you can trust what the website does once it's got the data. Um, I totally agree with you about the SSL thing. It does give people a false sense of security. Um, Plymouth, I mean, I, uh, for those that are here a couple of years ago, I did a, a talk on when one of our externally hosted websites was compromised. Um, that was purely down to the coding on that website. And um, we need some sort of certification for developers and almost an education program for developers so they fully understand um, how to develop a website securely from the bottom up. Because at the moment, um, it's almost a, a game of Russian roulette with websites when you put your data in. Um, yeah, so uh, essentially, the padlock is only providing one extra layer of security and essentially it is better to have the padlock than not because everything you send without uh, uh, SSL would just be clear text, okay? So all your cookies, all, uh, all the information that could identify you unless you have this padlock could, could be sent uh, over clear text. So essentially that is the message that uh, definitely we need to put across to the public to, to be able to recognize it and there have even been sites where they um, they show the padlock but it's not really they're not really using as a cell so um, being able to spot the differences uh, will be important but yeah absolutely definitely the for the, for the public's um, from the public's perspective this is not um, a fully secure site they still need to adopt um, secure practices um, but it just means that this message needs to be put across uh, so yeah I absolutely agree with John it's not just about the, the padlock it's uh, practices as well um, I don't think the public care whether it's a secure site <laughs> or not I think that when you fill out your, the form for your house insurance it asks you whether you've got five lever mortise locks on your doors and you tick the box that says yes, you don't really know whether you have or not. But even if you have, all that does is to make it more likely that the burglar is going to get into your house by putting a brick through your patio door. The public really aren't going to be able to digest whether something is being sent in clear text or not. They're just not going to think about it. They're going to be completely focused on buying that thing from that website so that it's delivered in time for their, their son's birthday. You know, th this is just not the way that people think in their daily lives. We may think like that. Many of us do think like that. Is this secure? I mean, the key point, I think, in all of this was the point that Maria made, which is that we should begin to rethink design. You know, we should have security by design. It should be the first thing that we think about when we're designing systems from here on in. But to rely on the public to do things that are, in our minds, sensible or rational, I think is foolhardy. You're never going to get the public to, to, to think along those lines. Why should they? It's not their job. It's our job as the people who design and implement the systems to ensure that they're secure. Okay, we have one question near the front, and I think that will be the last one we're going to have time for within this slot. Sarah, this way, please, with the mic. Um, stick your hand up so Sarah can see it. There we go. Okay, hopefully a very quick question. Uh, imagine I work for a very uh, cash-strapped public uh, authority. Um, I have a very limited budget. What should I spend it on? Should I spend it on educating the workforce or the latest uh, security product that's just come out? You should spend it on educating your workforce. 
<coughs> so that they don't come in with all kinds of stuff on memory sticks that they're plugging into your machines. Um, because that's, you're going to get a far greater bang for your security buck by doing that than you are on you know, buying the latest firewall software or whatever it is that you've got in mind. And I would say uh, it would definitely be worth thinking about the whole strategy and how your processes uh, will be running because if, um, you're, if you have a security culture, some things don't really cost money. It's about having thinking about the processes, how people should interact with uh, technology, the data, and essentially making sure that uh, you minimize these risks. And attitude through education, through um, practice and making sure that everybody follows uh, this, not uh, sort of um, the management will do one thing and the, the employers uh, will have to do the other. So some things uh, can be instilled within the security culture of an organization and it could, even if there are problems, uh, it could help minimize the effect, the impact of, of these problems. So yeah, I would definitely agree education would be very important, but security design as well. Go on, John, just, products. just a quick one for me. I mean, you'd need to do a cost-benefit analysis um, on the particular technologies, what you're actually trying to stop, where are your biggest risks. So say you had lots of your staff, whoever they may be, coming into lots of different offices um, and plugging USB sticks in, there's probably going to be a better payoff by investing in technology that blocked USB ports or even not even technology, a um, stick of... I would like glue to bl <laughs> yeah, glue up the ports to prevent them doing it. It's, it's, you need to work out a strategy that's best for your organization and the best payoff you're going to get for your investment, really. Other glue products are available. <laughs> okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're reaching the end of the slot. I'm just going to ask the panel one final question and it will try to elicit from a one-word answer. Um, so basically, panel, mandatory disclosure, one of the things that we started talking about here, good or a bad thing? Chris? A good thing. Maria? Definitely a good thing. And John? As somebody who works for an organisation that's had mandatory disclosure for the last 20 years, it's definitely a good thing. Excellent. We've got consensus on the final point. Ladies and gentlemen, would you join me in thanking the panel?